So I'm a, I'm a Craig Cipher, I am a psychologist. Um, so I'm going to talk about the or do without part of this. Um, so just to kind of give you the, the little Cliff Notes version of uh, my experiences. So uh, I'm the founder uh, of Cohesive Self, which is a global platform for emotional health. And so just kind of briefly, the problem was I have clients who are in pain. They're dealing with stress, they're dealing with depression, they're dealing with anxiety. And the tough part is that 168 hours a week, I have one. I have to assess what's going on. We have to work out skills in that moment. And we need to get a plan for what's going to go on in that, from that week that I'm working, working with them to the next week when I see them. And so I work with a lot of uh, you know, young men in particular. I was like a young guy, work with you know, a lot of young people. And so, uh, so I, would, I, would, I wouldn't see him for the week. And I'd try to check in with him and be like, all right, you know, like how's, how are things going? What's going on? And uh, you know, my typical you know, 22 year old guy that I was meeting with, like, he was lucky if you remember what he had for breakfast that day. Right? So be, thinking back to like, how was I feeling last Thursday, wasn't really working out. So the solution was, you know, everybody responds to their phone. Right? Like that's, that's the modern day Skinner box, right? Get that buzz, I gotta pull it out, I gotta see what's going on. So, uh, so the solution that I'm working on is uh, having a, a mobile app that can kind of help with mood and data tracking for people who are in therapy, um, access to resources for that time in between, so relaxation resources, uh, guided imagery can kind of help you with those difficult times in terms of your mood, and then providers can actually sign on and monitor that data through the week. You can see the data, you can see the trends, see what's going on, and meet with that person and say, <laughs> You know, what's going on? When, when everybody else's mood is picking up on Thursdays and Fridays, yours is falling through the, through the floor. So what's going on? And so how do you make, so then being able to kind of take that data to kind of, you know, enhance the interactions that are going on, do really good work in therapy, and help people out. So, you know, my, my process with this is I, you know, uh, um, I, I'm, so, I'm always looking for a technical co-founder, um, but I am antsy. I want to get this done. And so, uh, so my theory and my approach to this as, as I kind of met people, and I, I met some great guys, especially particularly in Rochester, and the ones I, want, I met were either really entrepreneurial, they were, they were like, that sounds like a great idea, Craig, but I'm working on my stuff. Or, you know, I meet with a guy like, uh, like, like Nathan over here, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, what do you think, you know, like, what, what's your prospects for, like, what's going on? He's like, and it's like September, and he's like, yeah, he's like, maybe in uh, March or April, we can sit down and have a talk. So the guys who were really good that I met, the Nathan Hendersons and the Paul Souls, those guys are incredibly busy. So I was too antsy to kind of wait. So my theory, my approach was that, you know, if I can't cook, you know, like I can't even get past that hello world stage in terms of the development, um, I, I need to be at least be able to order a decent meal. So this is kind of how I went about it. So my dining guy, my approach to kind of figure out how I was going to get a decent meal, get my meal made, um, get connected, get informed, get it interpreted, and get it made. So get connected. There's, for me, there's great resources here. Things like Bar Camp. Um, there's a, a health tech pitch contest in Chicago. I have a lot of connections to Chicago, um, where I was able to kind of pitch out there. Um, you know, kind of searching out events. Things like Startup Weekend. Uh, connected to community groups like Rochester Tech Startups and at Rochester. So there are a lot of kind of resources that I can kind of get connected to. Just take this idea and just kind of get it out there. Like, does this make any sense? You know, does it make any sense when I talk to people about it, or is it just me as the egghead psychologist thinking about it? this is just something that I got on. Um, so what was really interesting, I got connected to, through that process, uh, technical advisors, people who were in startup space, and being able to kind of uh, help me kind of through it and kind of help me to kind of get educated. Which, the next part was kind of get informed. So here's some of the things that kind of helped me to kind of get informed. Um, ASAP is a great book for like, if you're just completely not technical, coming out from like, Beginning to end, Ken Yarmish has, has a website too that's great. Um, Steve, uh, you know, in terms of uh, Steve Blank, I mean, between his website and his book, um, and Lean Startup Methodology, really influenced like you know where I'm coming from and how I how I'm starting and how I'm approaching this. Uh, Got to give a nod to the Nextplex guys because kind of it keeps me connected with everything that's going on here. So even things that normally, as a psychologist, I never would have gone to or got connected to, like a UX meeting last weekend. Uh, last week that I went to that was like an excellent experience. It was great. 
Um, with the technical advisors I got connected to, I noticed who they were following on Twitter, who they were tweeted, you know, so being able to kind of connect it to, to a community that's outside of my own through that. And, um, and at Rochester, I met which is a great group here, specifically for the mobile development. So in terms of getting it interpreted, I had to be able to kind of take that vision that I had in my head and, um, and get my meal made. So that, so that idea of like, you know, I couldn't cook it myself, but I needed to be able to kind of have that communication of what I wanted. So creating user stories, you know. So, um, so John, who's the 22-year-old guy who calls me, like what's the start to finish product of how he was going to use this app? How is the provider going to use the web interface? And, um, and that kind of helped me to kind of create something that was like a, a common language that I could communicate with, with the devs that I worked with. Um, and then creating wireframes. I had a vision in my head of, of what I wanted to look like. Um, and some of the ones that, uh, you know, there's uh, Balsamic is a great one. That's kind of where the image is from. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Keynote. I do a lot of presentations as a psychologist. So uh, um, Keynote, I'm a big fan of Keynotopia actually has like kind of built-in wireframing tools for, for mobile, for web that you can just use as Keynote slides. So there's presentation slides. You can do click-through wireframes that look and act just like what you want your video to look like. Um, so get it made, there's kind of a wealth of options out there um, for, you know, kind of design stuff that you could do uh, uh, really, really inexpensively, things like uh, CrowdSpring and 99 Designs, which is uh, my, where my logo came from, it was actually from CrowdSpring, um, Elance and Odesk, where I know uh, people who have uh, gotten, you know, uh, mobile apps built for you know, very, very inexpensively. Um, some of the other options that I kind of pursued and talked with people about, partnering with the university program for like Center for Student Innovation, you could have a co-op student that you could hire and bring on, um, you could work, have uh, kind of extra support that's kind of built in through here, so if you do kind of a donation that's tax deductible through your business, um, then you can kind of have some, a little bit of oversight and help and support through Center for Student Innovation here at RIT. Um, talk, talked with uh, dev shops all over the place. Folks here, uh, you know, Chicago, Cincinnati, uh, Austin, Texas, Dallas, Texas, just met with a ton of different people um, who at least, you know, kind of got some feedback from um, everything from uh, kind of the, the one guy who previously was at Kodak and got laid off and was, was currently a freelancer um, to a, a shop in Chicago that made all Groupon's mobile apps. And so, of course, they were like, yeah, so, you know, we're looking at maybe a five-week development cycle and about 25K a week. And, uh, Guys think I am again, but uh, <laughs> so so again, like this wide range of like what it was like out there, um, and then there's completely outsourced options. Like I uh, had some meetings with um, a group out in um, in India, so at, at I was skyping with them at 8 8 30 in the morning, um, and it was like 6 30 7 p.m. their time, um, talking with them, kind of kind of exchanging with them. So completely outsourced, where the project manager was on site, and then the option I ended up going with was a little bit of a hybrid. So I had an onshore. Uh, project manager, a group that I work with through um, uh, uh, from Austin, Texas, called Fact Technologies. Um, so that onshore project manager kind of helped kind of guide through the process. Had a designer who kind of um, worked with him, and then all the mobile and web development was all outsourced to Pakistan. So that's how I was doing it in a way that was kind of bootstrapped and cheap and expensive for me, but that works in terms of what I was looking. That's my process. Thanks. Um, probably time for one question if anybody's got one while I'm going to set them up. It's for Craig. I'm going to take the picture of the vote. So, the commission. Yeah, so from uh, signing the contract to App Store. Uh, let's see.
Uh, it's going to sound like cool family. Right, right. Mine, mine was for do without. Okay. So that was. And so, I get a few products. So it worked out okay. Uh, any noise along the way? Bumps in the road? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I get it. Um, and some good technical advisors can help me in terms of crafting what I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, were, were really helpful. Um, but, but yeah, there's an, an ongoing post. So, as you know, I think I think I wasn't always the top priority for you know, either the PM or you know, the dev that was working with so um, it was so it certainly helps. Uh, I'm Adam Lindsay. Um, okay. Where do I fit in? Uh, when Taryn asked me to present, uh, we were discussing this. There's probably going to be a little bit of overlap between Nate and myself. He comes more from a designer background, but I think uh, we'll probably say a bit of the same thing. Um, let's see here. Uh, I did Startup Weekend most recently. I've done two node knockouts. I think one man's rumble. I don't know. It's great at this point. Uh, worked for a local startup who will remain nameless because I had a very bad experience. Worked for an e commerce startup out of New York City. Um, I run the Rochester JS user group and I'm very active in uh, co working Rochester. Um, up until, I don't know, about two months ago or so, I've been running everything under my own business called Next Feature, basically freelance development, uh, Node.js, uh, Ruby on Rails work, uh, pretty much anything that anybody would hire me for. I'm kind of changing that now and concentrating on my startup uh, web host style, which is just concentrating on uh, higher end uh, web hosting for marketing agencies and designers. So, what I really wanted to do is just do's and don'ts. Uh, I come from a technical background, but obviously I've had my own startup now, and I've uh, successfully built my own business, but I've also worked for other startups, so I kind of have the unique position of being able to see both angles. Um, first thing, so we're gonna, we're gonna be positive initially, because there's a don't slide as well. Uh, tell me what you're bringing to the table. If you are a non-technical person, you need to tell me what you're going to do. As a technical person, I'm very skeptical. Uh, most technical people are very arrogant that they can build the world. That's not necessarily the case. Um, as a non-technical person, you need to tell me what you're bringing to the table. Are you going to be out there doing sales? Are you going to be making phone calls? Are you dealing with the legal issues? Are you bringing money? What are you doing? Because if you're not doing technical, tell me what you're doing other So, uh, related, share goals and directions. Um, all too often when I've sat down with people that are approaching me to do technical work, um, they don't really give me a whole lot of information. It's just kind of like, I got this great idea. Okay, where do you see it in a year? Where do you see it in five years? How do you see growth happening? You know, and I don't actually any, uh, expect any of that to come true, but at least have given it some thought. Um, talk to me about the competitors. Uh, this is probably the easiest uh, flag that uh, gets set initially. If you can't name a competitor or name someone that's doing something similar or how you're going to compete with them, I know that you haven't thought out the problem. Uh, that is is very clear kind of big red warning sign. Um, and related to that, discuss potential problems. Uh, all too often I've sat down with non-technical people and they got this beautiful idea and everything's going to be great and we're going to be wealthy and it's going to be cool and all we need is this mobile app and if, as long as you build my website, I'll give you 50% of zero and you don't tell me anything about the actual problems that you're going to face. What is the competition? Obviously, we went on over that, but you know, is this going to need a lot of capital? Is this going to be a difficult thing to scale? Is, is there some type of hurdle? Um, I had a, a, a person approach me probably about five, six years ago. I also do a lot of uh, stock trading, options trading, uh, and I had an individual approach me about writing this whole financial application. And some of my first questions were, is this even legal with the SEC? And he actually didn't know. That's not a good sign. I mean, if you're a, a non-technical person with this idea, do that research before you're approaching someone like myself to build your app. Because the last thing I want to hear is that you're not even sure if this is legal or not. So, um, show me, I, I, I kind of hinted at this a few times and Nate's probably chuckling over there. Because uh, him and I have used this a lot. Show me that you have more than an idea. Ideas are very, very, very inexpensive. Um, all of us are very smart individuals. We're all sitting here in this room for a reason. I'm sure we've all had million dollar ideas and billion dollar ideas. It doesn't really matter at all. Uh, it's all about execution. So you could think that you had the next greatest idea, 
getting a bill, obviously you're talking to someone like myself, so you can't bill yourself, or you need help, show me that you've done more than that. Um, and the last one, I threw this in here. Uh, legal is also another red flag that kind of springs up for me, and I think it comes from a background of having my mother as a paralegal, my father as a police officer, and aunt and uncles that were attorneys, but I always ask the question of, how it fits in as a legal structure, have you LLC, have you US Corp, have you given it thought on how it's going to be? Um, and I'll also ask some pressing questions of a non-technical person of, you know, do we have to worry about any restrictions or taxes or anything like that? Um, the Open Coffee Club had a great presenter uh, a few weeks ago that was talking about all the tax codes and laws. And that's actually a great uh, set of questions to start asking someone. If they're selling product or services or so, ask them if they've even done that research. I, I think all too often uh, people will say, oh yeah, I'm going to build this great national product and we're going to roll it out internationally and stuff. It's like, yeah, are you going to be subject to weird taxes? And if they don't know, they're not doing enough homework. And again, that comes back to, you know, you've got to show me what you're doing on your end and then I can do the technical stuff. So now we'll get to the negative stuff. Um, this is so easy, God, I've been on the receiving end of this so many times. Uh, don't tell me how wealthy we're going to be. Uh, that doesn't um, Unless you have a real incredible business plan and somehow you've got some massive experience coming into this and you've really done your homework, and I've never met anyone like that. Uh, you, you can't sell me on the idea that we're going to be millionaires in three months. That, that doesn't work. Um, a lot of young non-technical, I mean, I'm sorry, a lot of young technical people, uh, and no offense, but straight out of school or whatever, and they're trying to get their feet wet, they're going to fall for this. They're going to be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea, and you sound like you're more intelligent than me, so I'm going to go with it, and that's going to be great. And I'll be honest, I got burned by it when I was much younger in my career. Uh, anybody of worth that's understanding of how this whole game works, uh, they're going to see that as a huge flag. Anybody that's going to sit down and say, hey, we're going to be billionaires, and it's going to be great. That's not going to work. Um, NDA, Nate and I have actually talked about this, and I apologize if I'm stepping on his feet. Uh, there's, there's been some great articles about it. Um, and again, this comes back to tell me that you've got more than just an idea. The problem is, is if you only have an idea, the NDA is great at locking down and making sure that that idea stays protected. But again, it comes back to more of execution. So if you've got me signing a huge, complex, overly convoluted NDA that's basically going to ruin my career from here on out and I'll never be able to work in New York State again, um, which is not true because it's a right to work state, but uh, that shows up as a huge flag as well. I mean, if I'm sitting down with you and you're, you're saying, hey, uh, this idea is a billion dollar idea and you got to sign this three, four page NDA, I, I know that there's a problem there. Um, whereas if you're sitting down with me and you're saying, this idea is great, we've got to get to the market first, don't worry about signing off on NDAs, let's just get it going and stuff. That's a, it's a bit more of a different approach. And that, that's not true for every business. Obviously, I'm kind of throwing broad nets there, but um, things that I've kind of noticed. Um, the other one, and this one definitely comes up, and these last two are kind of related. Um, don't sit down and tell me that you want this built in technology XYZ. Um, you're coming to me for technical advice. If you've got some very specific things. So for instance, that individual that spoke to me uh, many years ago about the financial system. You know, back then there was only a few ways to really tie in with an API or even a, what's, I don't even call it an API, to tie into the stock market and be able to get the real-time data. There's only a handful of ways at the time to do that correctly. Um, he had done the homework and he had at least figured that out. Uh, that was a technical requirement. That's totally understandable. Uh, all too often I'll sit down with people and they'll be like, oh yeah, this, this has got to be built in rounds. And you're like, why? And they don't really have a reason to pass that. Um, and the, that's funny because you're a rest developer. So, and then related to that is uh, don't spec time and cost. Uh, I, the local startup that I work with here in Rochester, um, they love to do this for me. Uh, I'd, I'd come in once a week and we could sit down and go over everything that they'd uh, figured out and uh, they were trying to pitch and sell at the same time as building, which was very convoluted and didn't work. Um, and they'd say, oh, we need to feature XYZ and we know this is only going to take you an hour. No, you don't. You have no idea how long it's going to take me. And oftentimes they'd be wrong both ways. Uh, it would take me 15 minutes or it would take me three hours. They had no idea. And the problem is, is that and I was already introduced as kind of a, a negative connotation of, well, somehow I'm now supposed to meet their expectation of an hour. 
um, and that just kind of creates a whole riff. So um, I, I guess what I'm saying in, in summary of all of this is really, it's, it's all about communication. And if you really look at the do's and don'ts that I, don't, that I have here, a lot of it is just solved by the non-technical and the technical people actually talking about the business. Don't worry too much about the technology. Don't worry too much about this or that. Actually sit down and talk about the business. Um, the technical stuff, obviously you're coming towards a technical person that's going to get solved, or at least you know, should be solved um, if you're hiring the right person. But a lot of these things will uh, kind of work itself out if, you, if you're open about the business. And I think all too often, and anybody that I've ever said no to, uh, they were too secretive and too close uh, about what the business was going to become or the direction that it was going. Or they had lofty ideas or lofty goals that were probably never going to be met. So, um, yeah, that's all I really had. And I just guys want to hear horror stories. Um, start off. your mind for asking about horror stories. <laughs> yeah, it's, I've got horror stories, so. Um, yeah, all right, all right, quick horror story. Um, so this is why I quit to start up in Rochester. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Now we're going to go through this whole thing again. Um, the reason I left the horror story of uh, the startup here in Rochester is they had, so I was the fourth developer onto the project. It, and they were trying to do it like, you know, we'll hire one developer and one designer and we'll kind of get this app out. It was a small enough app that that probably would have worked. Um, Unfortunately, it's the fourth developer in a year. That was a big warning sign. But they had a really good idea. Um, where it got interesting is that it was going fairly well. We met once a week, and you know, I'd be building those features that they needed and wanted. Um, then it became pretty obvious that there was a lot of pushback. Uh, it was, why aren't we launching? This is ready to go. Well, customer X told us they need feature Y to get it launched. No, they don't. Uh, there's 18 other customers that are already ready to sign and give you guys money. And they kept away and away. Where it got really interested, it was like, oh, well, we're going to lose it. This is my perception of them. We're going to lose you, so now we want you to go back and document all the code and make sure that everything is 100% documented and stuff. And when I told them that this is going to be to take about two months to do, because we've got to basically go back and not, you know, go through the, the level of documentation they want was insane. And they're like, well, we got to create a manual so that if we hire new developers, they'll be able to catch up to speed. Um, the funny thing is they did hire a developer right after I quit, and he was up to speed in three days. He quit about a month later as well. So. All right, cool. Hi, guys. I'm Mark Lucas. Um, I have a startup. It's called MySudo. A um, little bit of background about myself. I'm uh, a technology executive. So I've been in the technology space for the past nine years. And so some of my experience, um, I was at Navin Tribridge for a while. That's a ERP, MRP, CRM provider. Um, worked with Microsoft, SAP, PeopleSoft. Um, spent some time at Entree. It's an IT services, managed services, application development shop. Um, Uber Garbage, the data security, data and information security shop. And uh, most recently, I've uh, been at my startup. It's called MySudo. It's a digital identity that pays. So basically, I'll just give a quick high-level overview of MySudo. It's, it's basically it's an anonymous digital profile that allows the consumer or yourself to control how you share personal and mobile data with businesses, brands, daily deal platforms, etc. Um, for consumers, what it does is it lets you share, leverage, and monetize your, your data while protecting your privacy and identity. Um, gives users more benefits to sharing data without the risks on the privacy side. Uh, puts analytics in front, so you centralize um, your personalization, and you're essentially signaling your intent to the marketplace, and you're letting providers come to you instead of the other way around. Typically, it's a company like Facebook who owns and controls data, uh, whereas our business model is kind of flipped and reversed. The consumer owns and controls their own data set and then basically opens it up to, to who wants to get to them. For the merchants and uh, businesses, obviously, putting analytics in a pre-sale position is a very strong value proposition. Um, improves the value chain and reduces the marketing waste. So instead of uh, selling a $20 for $40 Groupon and only keeping $10 of that $40 sale, 
Um, there's able to be more revenue for the merchant when it's only the consumer and the business kind of correcting, connecting directly. But um, hopefully another time I'll come back and do a more detailed pitch on that business. Um, you're scheduled for October. October, I think, right. So let's get into the co-founder thing. The problem, obviously, is how do you find co-founders when all you have is an idea and no capital? Um, the challenge is uh, any resource that you really need, they're typically high-paid people, right? They're already working. Um, a lot of the entrepreneurial resources who would talk to you about a startup, they already have side projects. Um, it's very difficult also to, to validate your concept and business model or demonstrate that you have a really strong product market fit when you don't have a product to show. Um, also, you need a lot of times you need a strong team to attract good talent. You know, good talent doesn't want to work on a team where they're the only talented individual. So you've got a lot of chicken and egg type problems when you have an idea and no capital and you need people to come work for you. Um, you know, your only leverage really at the beginning is giving ownership and equity in, in a company that's really valueless at this point. So. There's a problem. Um, how do you prepare to be successful um, when you have all these challenges? Uh, number one, first and foremost, you need to be really passionate about your project and what you're doing. I think it always helps when you, you have more than just, hey, I'm passionate about making a lot of money or I'm passionate about building cool things. If you have a longer vision that you're passionate about or something that you want to change, like, you know, we wanted to change you know, the way that data is exchanged online. You know, we wanted to change the way people market to people. Um, so when you have a bigger problem that you're solving, that's it's always helpful. Um, do what you know and do it well. So like me, I'm a, I'm a business side guy. I've done a lot of sales. Um, I do a lot of market research. I do a lot of, you know, um, understanding different market trends that are happening and trying to formulate a plan to capitalize on those. So, you know, sell your sell the idea, sell the long-term vision, um, build a solid business plan first, uh, create detailed use cases. That's really important when you're when you're talking to people who think analytically and technically. Um, you don't necessarily want to talk about your business model. You want to talk about how your product is going to be used, and you know, really think it through. Back to you know some of the points on the do nots. You know you don't want to come in unprepared. You want to be able to relate to the technical people exactly what you're looking to do. And you know building out some great use cases is always good. Um, I found that you know I follow a network, talk, learn, validate, and repeat that process. So you you want to do that to kind of back your idea and continue to refine it. it should be like a working. It should be like a. a a working document. You're always improving it, just like you improve your story, you improve your pitch, um, you improve the way that you're talking to technical co-founders to try to get them on your project. Um, some words of wisdom. Um, treat ideas like projects, not businesses, so you don't get too emotionally attached. I found a lot of people get so emotionally attached to their idea that there's no way in the world that you can tell them that's a horrible idea. It's never going to make money. Um, the market's not big enough, there's already people doing it. I mean, some people get really emotionally invested in what they're doing. Um, so I always try to treat ideas like projects. That way, if a project's not going well, you kill the project. You don't kill your dream, right? So um, understand not every idea is a good idea. Don't be afraid to start over, try again. Um, if you're a problem solver, you're an idea guy, I mean, you can continue to pump out ideas until you find one that hits the mark. Um, don't give up, be persistent, keep looking for your technical co-founder or design co-founder, whatever you're looking for. So kind of my story on, on what I did, um, I had an idea and a concept for the, this platform for user-owned and controlled data marketplace. And what I did is I set up a meeting over, over beers with uh, a guy who was a lead architect at a software development shop. And, uh, you know, piqued his interest first. I didn't come on happy. I came on kind of light. And um, you know, after I piqued his interest, I reviewed some use cases, reviewed the business plan, went through the investor presentation. 
And then I kind of got them involved in phases. So I didn't come forward saying, be my partner, be my technical co-founder. It was more like, hey, can you help me write this spec? And then once you help me write the spec, I said, hey, can you help create an estimate so we know how much money we need to raise? And then it was, can you help me with the SRS? And then finally it was, hey, let's start putting some code together on this thing. Um, so once he was more invested in it, and he got emotionally invested and attached to what he was doing, he started to really believe in what we were doing and what the goals we were trying to accomplish. And um, that's when we talked more in depth about bringing him on as the technical co-founder for the project. Um, so once he came on board, it was more more easy for me to secure other co-founders. Um, you know, later I secured a design co-founder and a development ops co-founder. So that rounded out to a four-person co-founding team. Um, you know, always think beyond just your technical co-founder. You know, if you're reading a lot of the trends and you follow a lot of the startup news, you know, uh, technical co-founders are becoming less and less critical and design user experience, um, user interface type co-founders are very important. I mean, Apple's shown us, you know, build something that's beautiful and that works and people will use it. So, you know, it's really important, I think, to focus a lot more on, uh, if you're looking for co-founders, look for a well-rounded team of co-founders, not just adding yeah, a technical guy. You know, you, you want to get people on your team as cost-effectively as possible because obviously the more equity, sweat equity you put into the business, the less of that money, if you do raise money successfully, needs to be used in hard resources. Um, use advisors and mentors to fill gaps. Um, investors invest in teams they believe in, um, not so much just a product or an idea. Um, so the ability to execute really is, is everything in, in what you're doing. Um, I think I was talking to potential investors all the way from the beginning with just an, uh, an SRS and an idea, um, all the way through to when I had four co-founders and we were actually building a product. So I think that the investment decision really came when we had a very well-rounded team and we were on our way to building our MVP. So um, personally now, what, where we're at is um, we just raised a seed round of funding, um, a little above 500K. We're gonna use that to uh, do a regionalized launch of the product. And uh, in 12 months, we have another round planned, um, a, a larger round. It's almost fully subscribed to 10 million. And uh, that'll be for a national rollout. So as long as we hit some milestones in between now and 12 months from now, um, we'll be able to hit the goals that you know we originally outlined in the business plan well before um, I even had a co-founder. So that's kind of how I went about finding a co-founder or co-founders for the business. And um, it's the contact information if you want to get in touch. We are looking for technical resources right now. We're looking for uh, mobile developers and PHPs and framework guys. Um, so if you've got those skills, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, we're, we just got our new office. We're in Office Park Way. That's the Toby Office Park. And uh, we should be launching uh, by the uh, mid-September, mid to end of September. So, thank you. Do, I, do we want to do questions now? Or do we well, do want to just do the panel? Um, we'll get going, but let's do it. Oh, yeah, we got one. Let's take a question. How about you, Alan? Sure. You were talking about how you kind of, with your first co-founder, kind of just slowly, like, different stages. Yeah. Was that intentional, or did it just sort of happen that way? No, it was definitely intentional. So you kind of knew what you were doing. You knew that. Yeah. I treated it almost like a sale. You know, that there was a, you know, I had my goals, and I knew what I was looking for, and I know that he had his goals. He knew what he was looking for, and you know, he was in a comfortable position, so I had to, it was almost a soft side. It was like, you know, you can't jump the gun and, and ask somebody something and make it feel uncomfortable. It was almost like, okay, I, I wanted it to have an emotional attachment to the idea, invest some time in it, and really understand deeper what we were doing um, than one night over here telling them about an idea. So, you know, just, just letting him know it was, it was well thought out. There was a lot of time invested in it. 
It wasn't just a uh, you know, willy-nilly concept. I'm a designer and front-end developer. Uh, I'm co-owner of a small local uh, web development shop. Uh, and uh, which originally was not supposed to be a web development shop. So if you want advice on how to uh, not let you know, your dreams of building something turn into something else, talk to me later. Um, <laughs> So uh, I've actually, uh, that company's part of before, uh, has been kind of in full um, business mode for the past you know, four or five years now. Um, I'm also now uh, starting up a new, what you probably consider a kind of product-based, info product-based lifestyle business startup thing uh, that is launching real soon now, uh, but more than that later. Um, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, before I was a designer and uh, front end developer guy, which I always kind of had a personal interest in, um, I actually worked uh, at Apple in sales. Uh, I was a consultant and channel account executive uh, at Apple uh, from not long before the launch of the first iPod until uh, after the launch of the first iPhone. Uh, so a good set of years there, and I decided I want to do something more creative. So I want to talk real quickly about uh, why design is important, first of all. I kind of talked about this last week at the UX meeting, uh, downtown Detroit and Rochester. And you know, most importantly, design is how it works. So you know, at a startup, when you're building your product, when you're building your service, uh, when you're defining how it works, uh, that is design. Uh, it's not a you know, veneer that you're uh, you know, sliding on the product and it's not frosting on the cake, it's the whole thing. Um, also important, if you're choosing to go forward building your product without someone that maybe you feel is a designer, um, you're a designer. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, design is not magic. Design uh, is, is a set of skills that can be learned, I think, by anyone. Uh, just like you can learn to program, just like you can learn entrepreneurship and business skills, you can learn design as well. So this is a viable option for some people. Uh, of course, the startups, uh, as is Mark kind of alluded to, um, it's all about specialization. It's time's a factor. So it's not always a good idea to try to be the one man band. You might want to reach out and build that team. Uh, and like I said, invest, uh, investors will look into that too. Um, also, like Mark said, companies that focus on design and companies that care about design, they win. And I think if, if recent financials are any, uh, of any meaning to you, they wouldn't be. Um, also, if you look around the industry, um, big tech companies, whether Facebook or Twitter or others, they're grabbing up designers like crazy. Uh, I've never seen anything like it before. So that, that definitely is talent. Um, also, because it's so important to be uh, Design's how it works. Don't forget that ever, 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 ever. So, um, who are you when you're founding something? Uh, I kind of lump the roles into these three, and you can maybe break out a little further, but I think three is a nice, nice number this way. But, uh, I think I have design responsibilities, engineering, and what we'll lump together as business. Um, all those things combine uh, to, to really define what your startup is about. Um, those are also roles, and they can be fluid. They don't necessarily have to be separate people. Uh, there can be overlap. It could be a team of you know, 10 or more people, it could be three people, it could be two people who have some overlap in their skills. But it's important to recognize that all three things have to be represented um, in any product that you're trying to build. Um, they're super important. Um, this kind of talks a bit about uh, things that I am scared by, and it may see some overlap for what Adam mentioned as well. Uh, I put all these as quotes. So if you or if you've ever heard someone say, I've got this great idea, I just need someone to build it. Uh, run. Uh, or if you said that, don't admit to anyone here that you've ever said that. Uh, it's kind of exactly what I was talking about. I need someone who knows XYZ technology uh, and uses XYZ software. Um, the exception is if you already have something built that's already in progress, and yeah, that's valid. But if you don't have anything yet, um, and you're not the engineer, you're not the design person, I have no business defining what tools are being used. Um, that's not your area of expertise. That's why you're working for the co-founder. Um, this is going back to my design how it works. Um, that's scary to me. Uh, 
Um, and I, I know it's maybe not scary to some people, but again, building something uh, to that new mobile product stage without really thinking about design is probably a bad idea. It costs you a lot. Uh, and this is, if you're playing it in Puzzle Vigo, that, that just turns me off. I mean, it's not, not interesting. Um, something Mark kind of talks about, uh, designers may be hard to find or hard to recruit in some regards. Um, many people, and again, this applies in some ways, I feel more enraged to this kind of cultural thing in this area, but um, people may have steady employment already. Um, or if they are looking for a job, they may want steadier employment than what you're willing to offer or what you can't offer uh, as an early stage startup. Um, this Probably not a huge issue in Russia, I've not really seen this in local design houses, but it's definitely an issue in bigger cities. Um, designers who are employed may have non compete clauses, uh, they may have no delay clauses in their employment uh, contracts, so be careful with that. Uh, if that's a legal issue that you don't want, it's about to get an ass. Um, and you ought to ask, because uh, it's possible that that designer might not know. Um, and lastly, like, set yourself apart. Have a real plan, have a uh, willingness to listen and to learn, um, and have more than an idea like uh, even before it's not already said. Uh, that stuff is really, really important. Uh, and lastly, are you actually looking for a co founder? Uh, I hope you are, because uh, well rounded teams make great products. Um, but as you're talking to people, as you're recruiting people, um, are you actually open to accepting input? And this is an interesting one to me, is like, are you willing to let your product, the vision of your product, change as you're building? Because sometimes the most important things uh, happen while you're building. You have a realization or somebody brought on the team and have this, you know, this idea that changes what you're all about. And the ability and the willingness uh, to go with that um, can be really important. Um, are you willing to share your success? and all that other type of stuff. Um, if, if you're not willing to, to share that success, if you're trying to pull one over on people, that's, that's not going to burn you just immediately. It's also going to hurt your reputation forever. Um, and this is kind of speaking to perhaps the non-technical co-founder, but any first founder of an organization, can you really excite people? Can you entice them to uh, by a vision of what you want to create? And are you able to communicate in such a way that the people you bring on believe in that initial vision just as much as you can? Um, that's really important. You know, I talked about last week with the UX meeting that user experience isn't just one person's job. It's not just someone's title. Uh, it has to be at all levels of an organization. And in a startup, the, the vision for your product, your service, uh, needs to be uh, at every level and in every team. Um, so, yeah, um, that's kind of my view of things uh, as a designer. Yeah. You see the poke to get harder at something than the guys on the fourth of the Okay. Uh, what the people are thinking. That may have come from experience, but no, no. It's just, uh, I find myself in final agreement with every one of you so far. Okay. So, nicely done, Chase. If you agree with me, you're right. <laughs> but, um, That's what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I just need someone to build it. Yeah. And are they really looking for a partner? Yeah. And, and you poke that a little harder than, than some of these other guys. I think in looking for a technical co-founder, that's a huge deal. So I, if you want to expand on that, or it's for about kudos, but if you want to expand on that, a lot of people aren't. They say they are, and they aren't. Yeah, I've experienced it firsthand of a couple of failed ventures with early on, where, yeah, co-founders co were going to do all this great stuff, and, and it didn't pan out because they were trying to pull over on people, or they were trying to, you know, nickel and dime, or, or do things in such a way that didn't engender trust, and that was... Uh, so that was so how do you tell? You know, what, what are some of the tells on the way in that you can in that Oh, uh, things like, you know... Justice won't. Yeah, justice is huge. I mean, and some of that just comes from conversations, spending you know real face time with people, and some of it comes from you know the, the too thick 
uh, NDA, so it comes from you know, early stage stuff where you shouldn't be. Yeah, I'll give you an example of those involved in an early kind of healthcare bioinformatics type uh, thing. Maybe not quite, but involved medical records, uh, digital medical records. And oh, great. All players all well knew each other. We'd all, all work together in some capacity, considered pretty friendly. And then this was supposed to be an iPad application. Um, and those of us the team, you know, uh, on the dev side of things, we'd spent dozens of hours already uh, outlining and planning and writing uh, some really early stage planning documents and, and specs and stuff that, that we thought was there. And then the, the other partners were in kind of the medical side of the industry. And we got to the point where, like, you know, iPad was new, we didn't have iPad, we didn't really feel like spending our money on it, and, you know, they were going to be investing in this with us, and they wouldn't even toss a few hundred dollars, you know, a couple thousand dollars at buying iPads for the team without stacks of labor paperwork, and who owned this, and all that. It was such a turn. And it was such a red flag, and it, it, it you know, it set it off for me. Express my dissatisfaction with that. And then, you know, without fail, a few weeks later, that attitude rippled out to other areas of, of what was happening and the whole thing fell apart. Um, so, those types of things, you know, you, you'll know your gut reaction is probably right uh, in a lot of those cases, in my opinion. But mind you, if someone says, it's my startup and they have co founders, yes, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> yep. It should be more like this is our startup, start or whatever right? you want. You know, I think when you're looking for co-founders, you want somebody who's going to get passionate and be equally as emotionally invested in what you're working on. So to attract that, you have to project that, right? And, and a lot of times that goes back to that emotional attachment to your idea. Some people get so emotionally wrapped up in what they're doing that it's always theirs. And that turns out to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, the thing we're working on right now, which is kind of more lifestyle business, and it is literally just me. Um, and but at the same time, I mean, I'm, I'm doing the work right now based on uh, a history uh, in my own employment, my own experience that I, I feel like a lot gives me a somewhat unique position to pull it off, at least initially. I'm going to need more people eventually, but when that happens, I want them to take ownership and to believe it in it as strongly as I do. My question um, I want to share in that success. And anyone, like, like Mark says, who wants to, they want to keep it for themselves. Uh, that's, that's a bad sign. That's what's scary. Well, so if, if I summarize the takeaway that I'm getting, you're exactly right about this from the talk so far. If you're a non technical co founder looking for a technical co founder, um, you're being qualified as hard as you're qualifying them, probably harder. Yeah. I, th I think there's a lot of skepticism from technical, or you know, I kind of lump designers into technical. That is a, a, a level of expertise. Well, I would like to do that because you dress well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so we're super skeptical, but also because of experience. We've all heard the you know the guy with the million dollar idea who's in the building. So uh, if you can differentiate yourself from that, if you can bring the investors, if you can bring the business acumen, if you can bring um, or handle stuff that we don't want to deal with. You know, maybe as a designer or developer, I don't want to have to deal with lawyers. You know, that can be your purview. Uh, if, I, if I don't want to do you know, business projections and that type of stuff. I think actually anyone at all should care about that, but that's another thing. But um, you know, that specialization is important. In, in, a, in a longer kind of presentation I've done about my journey, uh, I've kind of talked about how partnerships I can feel are, are a game of fuck, marry, kill. Everybody play, 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 play fuck, marry, kill. So it's kind of like, all right, the Kardashian sisters, you got to decide which one you're going to fuck, which one you're going to marry, which one you're going to kill. And, and I think. I think partnerships are like that. Like if, if it's if it's just fucking, you need to know that. You know, if I'm just paying for the service, if you're, if you're providing me with that service, that's great. But like the way Mark talked about how he went, that's you know, it's kind of the approach I approached with my wife. I just tried to marry her on the first day. You know, kind of got to know her. Kind of got her. Got her who's, who's the scene that I'm, I'm kind of putting on? And what am I? What do I have to offer? And you build that relationship. So I mean, I, I kind of see myself as out there dating right now in terms of finding right. something. Partner with, but you know, and, and when it and when it goes wrong, you know, when, when, when that's the feeling in your stomach, you need to kill. Right? You know, it's, yeah. it's done. I, I think uh, non-technical people don't realize how, and this might sound odd, how networked and how much 
designers and developers communicate. Yeah. I mean, we're the type of people that go to user groups and participate in the community. And you know, Nate and I on numerous occasions have sat around co-working making jokes about you know various meetings that we have with people approaching us about ideas. And you know, you learn from that experience. I think anyone sitting next to us could have no experience with startups, and yet they'd still be able to pick out the warning signs and kind of get you know an initial idea. So, yeah. I mean, it's, I'd also caution you, man. I, I feel like I'm a little jaded here. Like, yeah, don't get discouraged by that, man. Right. Yeah. And there, there are good ideas out there, and they, they need to be implemented by talent. And uh, so that, that's why we're all here. That's the so you, you, you reminded me of a, of a, a several paper that came out in the Harvard Business Review more years ago than I mentioned. But it, it became the book, How to Be a Superstar at Work. But one of their observations was this was out of 18 Bell Labs. And it did a, did a in place study because uh, they found out there was some star performance and they couldn't figure out why because everybody's got great academic credentials. And, and among the technical people, they found a stealth network that had nothing to do with your chart. And it was an ad hoc economy where people give each other advice and help. And you get qualified based on your participation in that economy. You're either both competent and also trustworthy. And the fact is, one word from a technical person, some other nerd, nerd trusts, and you're either golden or dumb. This is the non-technical people. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're never wrong. Because they'll talk in, in, in pearl to each other. <laughs> um, I, 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 I've worked for a lot of marketing branding companies in the past. Um, and uh, there's a local marketing company that will remain nameless. And, uh, it was interesting because they finally called me back for a project uh, that they couldn't find any support for that I had originally built four years ago. And uh, it took them a long time to call me because we had a huge falling out. And one of the first things they said in the meeting was, we're having a real hard time in Rochester finding Rails developers. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, I'm an active participant in Rochester. You know, I, I, I kind of feel bad actually, and I actually got to come and work for them, but you know, they're actually pivoting to a completely different technology because they can quite literally not find their own developers. So, I don't know. Anyways, to it. Before I get started, I think one thing I just really kind of wanted to emphasize is what, especially what both uh, Nathan and Adam have kind of alluded to, but specifically the phrase that David had. You know, I have this idea, I just need someone to build it. That's like the, you know, the other dollars, I don't have a problem. It's, 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 that's just the whole thing. If someone has that, like that phrase, that, in, in, you know, that idea in their head, you know, I think if they need to either do a 180, uh, you, know, you really kind of need to do a 180 on how you're thinking, or if someone wants to really kind of stay with that, basically they have to think, all right, they're going to contract out. You're, you're going to be contracting out, you're spending a lot of money on developers. Uh, to just have someone as a contractor, just you're going to have hired help to have someone build it. So, just one thing I wanted to kind of emphasize. The, the only time that normally that would just shut my brain off immediately yeah. if I heard that. The only, the only except for that is like if I didn't hear that, and then this person had like a stack of paper and sketches and you know index cards, and they've got this whole idea actually mapped and planned out because maybe they can't use the software, maybe they, they can't program or whatever. Like that would actually almost get me interested again. Because they've actually put real thought in it. But too often it's it's all up here. And I'm like, I know what I want. I just need something to build it. That's scary. Well, that just in front of it just kills it. So yeah. Minimizing <laughs> that effort. So. Yeah, minimize. Yeah, you're actually right. I can build anything. I just need an idea. Just a thousand. My name is Kevin McGee. Uh, my background's uh, out of college. I moved to uh, Washington, D.C. from Rochester for a little bit. I uh, worked in Congress for about two and a half, three years. I uh, came back to Rochester and ended up getting into sales. I uh, worked at uh, Unisys, selling large-scale tape and disk storage. Uh, sorry, I was kind of a uh, sales, sales support, but was, was selling uh, large-scale tape and disk storage. Uh, from there, I went to um, LNK and selling uh, online learning, uh, a learning management system. Took a little hiatus, went to Florida for a little while, was selling an antivirus for a bit, came back, and went back to LNK. Uh, now I am working for a local development shop. We do uh, websites, web applications, and so on. So, a lot of my background, you know, 
my professional background, it's been in sales. So not only selling products or services, but even back when I worked in Congress, I was a policy guy. I worked with the Congressman Dell, kind of worked with uh, trade associations, uh, local organizations, things along those lines. So at that point, I was even selling ideas. So I've been in sales my whole career, and I've always been kind of a technical person. Um, I've always kind of been like one of those things where you put me in a group of like non-technical people, 50, 100 people in a room, 50 of them are technical, 50 are non-technical. Put me with those non-technical people, and I'm like number one, the most technical out of the non-technical people. Put me with the technical people, and I'm like number two or three, lowest. Um, so I'm always like on that kind of the cusp between the two. Uh, so what I've done really kind of over the past year and a half is really try to uh, fix that and become a lot more technical. Uh, you know, I've always had kind of a comprehensive knowledge of things. Like right now, you know, I know what a Ruby gem is, and if we're working on a project together, someone would say, okay. I could help people out, hey, have you heard of this Ruby gem? This does this, and it works with this, and everything. Ask me to like implement it and put it out there. Not even the slightest clue, well, a little bit, a little bit. Not, not, not much of a clue of actually how to do it. But I've had kind of a comprehensive knowledge of the industry because I'm interested in it. So I, you know, I've kind of witnessed other people doing it, other people talking about it. So my presentation's gonna be you know, quite a little bit different. Um, I'm really gonna fly through things. So um, yeah, I'm not going to explain things. My whole thing, the things that I'm going to be showing you, uh, the, the reason is uh, to, to, uh, to tell you, hey, you know, this exists. Uh, not necessarily to show it and explain it down. Uh, and specifically, the things I'm going to be showing you are things that I've used, tools that I have made, that I've used, uh, made use of, in order to become more technical. I've been doing a lot of uh, web design development, design slash development type of things, both learn, trying to learn both. Uh, spending a lot of time reading, looking, watching, listening, trying, experimenting, uh, failing, <laughs> fixing, failing, fixing, breaking, fixing, breaking, fixing. Um, so I'm just going to kind of fly through these things now. These are just examples. There's, these are some of the resources out there. If you're a non-technical person and you want to make yourself into a technical person, you can definitely do it. I mean, I, with maybe one or two exceptions. I've been, you know, coming to this group for uh, quite a little while. I came a little bit after it started. With one or two exceptions, I think that no one that I've spoken with is too dumb to be able to figure it out. And if you can figure these things out, if you do well in your job, you can figure it out. It might take you longer than someone else, like you know, say, you know, an Ethan, but um, but it's also taking me longer. But I'm making progress. I'm getting there. And, you know, I'm constantly working. So I was actually just happened to see this, and uh, this is actually just a, I'm not a map guy, so I have a little trouble with it. Um, but uh, this article is in Mashable, uh, non-techie co-founder learns code builds new site feature in six days. So this girl went and she learned Python and built everything, built uh, an extra feature to their, to their existing uh, startup uh, the web application that they had. This is a little bit of an extreme case. I don't really, you know, I don't say it, but I mean, it just seemed a little bit ironic. But as I was working on my presentation, this came along and I saw this. So specifically, one article that I thought was pretty, um, pretty kind of uh, provocative that was kind of, this kind of older is how to construct a web developer in 12 months. And believe it or not, you know, maybe the 12 months is going to be different per person, and, and, and specifically how much time each week, every week, you can actually um, put forth to it. But I really actually do believe that you know, the person with the right uh, amount of time, uh, the right kind of, uh, actually, uh, dedication and enthusiasm for it, can really go through and make themselves into a very decent beginning level uh, web developer uh, within about a year or so, if you can really dedicate time. He lists and gives, I would say, probably about 30 or 40 different resources. Uh, I've passed this off to quite a few people that come back and be like, wow, you know, that is great. We have to use quite a bit. How I got started? This book. <laughs> um, I would say this book, it's not totally high quality. Um, I would say, I tell people to start with this book. Don't commit to finishing it. Um, it's so, the, the one great thing about it is that it's so simple. It's so elementary. So when you get into this book, you're not going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't figure this out. I'm getting so frustrated. You're like, oh my gosh, I need to go faster. I'm picking this up quicker than the book is getting to. 
it's very, um, I don't know, very kind of, I mean, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pretty established web developers would look at this and be like, really? Are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I was like, drive racing in the neon. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but it's a place to start. Get your feet wet, get in there. Don't finish the book, because you're going to get into it, you're going to get bored, because they're not going to go fast enough. Um, but it's very, it's great, it's pretty low level. Something, uh, next one is not, uh, not quite as bad. Um, 30 days to learn HTML and CSS. You're not going to um, Some of these videos are you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, but I think it gives you some great, uh, um, you know, some great information. It gives you one video a day, and there's exercises, and there's homework, and then on those lines. So, and don't think that the site is saying you can learn all of HTML and CSS in 30 days. It's just spend 30 days. Next to, uh, to get on, um, another great thing is from uh, Code Academy, this is Code Year. All you do is you put your email and your address in there and uh, they'll send you a lesson uh, every week. Uh, so these are getting into a little bit more uh, kind of substantial resources. Things are going to be a little bit harder. If you want to go out and learn those things, these are the things that I've been using. Uh, Code School, this one's great. This one's a little bit more specific. Um, Nine bucks for the first month, um, but there's a lot of Ruby um, in there. And there's a lot of uh, there's some Node.js, I believe, and um, some uh, uh, jQuery and uh, JavaScript. A little bit more advanced, but uh, but still pretty uh, pretty good stuff. And the way they go through it is is, is pretty good. It definitely has some of its faults, uh, but there's some uh, some great stuff. Okay, so I've taken some classes, I've read books, I've tried things, and now what I'm going to do? Okay, I'm going to start building this site. Boy, this is slow. Okay, wait, do I build it this way? Do I build it that way? Right. What do I do? Okay, I'm starting from scratch. I'm learning a lot, but holy cow, it's slow. Bootstrap from Twitter. Um, uh, the next one, Bootstrap, there's, I'm going to show you two different kind of flavors of this. The next one's one uh, that I like a little bit more. Uh, it's called HTML Kickstart. It's a framework. So what they basically do is they give you the basic building blocks. Uh, so you go and you can make, you make web pages, you make uh, sites, things along those lines, specifically by really kind of just typing, uh, copying, and take, uh, copying and pasting the code into your website. So you want to make a page, you want to say you want uh, an order list. You use that code and you can take it over. Um, say that you want uh, a carousel. So, Shows you if you want you know, to put an image or you want like, an image slideshow. You can just take the code that they show you uh, and you can put it in there. Problems with this, now you're basically plagiarizing. That's fine. Build things, see how it works, break it, and fix it. Okay, they give me it like this. I want it, so they give it to me, it looks like this. I want it to make it do this. And I don't see where they tell me to do that. That's fine. Go ahead, break it, fix it, break it, fix it. I mean, that's, that's what you want to do. I think where I learned the most was being unoriginal. And working on Twitter bootstrap, working on HTML Kickstarter, going and breaking things that people have already built and making it the way I want it. You know, don't start out building a house, remodel a house. You, know, you start out, you, you leave the framework there, and then you just do really the exterior. Then as you go along, you know, start getting kind of deeper into it. So as you start to do that, you start to get some ideas. You want, all right, I want to make this a little bit more crazy. I don't know, my sites will be flat if there's one more so these are kind of really what I want. These are just a quick um, couple of different sites. They just show you all this stuff, um, all these different things that are out there. Um, and uh, they're basically just, just little blocks of what, uh, what, thing, what you can do. So you can put scraps of code, scraps of uh, HTML into your site, into, um, uh, you know, into the code that you're working on. Again, just another one of the side point. These are little collections of things that are actually out there. This white page right here, this is my Twitter account with my lists. It's not working within the iframe for, for bridge URL. So uh, you know another thing that I did is like really to keep um, uh, to keep out there is to to go and uh, take a look at Twitter. Follow a lot of the developers on Twitter. Watch what they're doing, see what they're learning about. Uh, Real quick, I don't want to dwell on this, but it's the uh, this is from one of those sites. Basically, he has you, he shows you how to build um, a one-page scrolling website. And they give you the code, 
So you know you can sit there and you can play with it and you can learn it, you can break it, you can fix it. Same thing with this one. Um, okay, so this is where we're gonna get into a little bit of something that I'm a little self-conscious with about. These are kind of projects that I've worked on. They're, they're just really kind of sandboxes, stuff I've played with some of So these are our uh, kind of web pages that I've, I've made. Ubuntu is a um, operating system. They had a really terrible website, so I resigned for it. Didn't tell them, just did it at home, just as an exercise for myself. So, you know, I've talked to you about how you know, all the things I've done. So here's kind of you know, some of the progress that I've, that I've made. A little bit nerve wracking to kind of show everyone actually. At this point, you know, I've been kind of working with for about a year and a half. Um, so again, these are just really kind of experiments, little things I've played with. Um, this next one, actually, this is something I'm kind of working on. A buddy of mine does construction on the side, so I'm kind of you know, making uh, this is kind of a, a mock-up, basically, of uh, a site that I'm making for him, so he may have um, a web page. You know, playing with a little bit of superfluous uh, CSS, two little little effects and things along those lines. Um, you know, they're not, uh, uh, these aren't really going to any design contests, um, but, you know, I see plenty of web applications out there that, that don't look quite as good as this. You know, these are, these are, you know, okay looking, but, you know, they're not, they're not bad. Uh, again, this is the, that same site that you just saw, just playing with some CSS a little bit. This is something where it's just basically, as I said, uh, this is actually one of those sites I showed you earlier, where you put the collections, you can download their stuff. And this is actually, I didn't make this site. I, Change the colors, I changed the transition, uh, I changed uh, pretty much everything I could change except for like kind of the, the basic layout of it. Um, so you know, I don't claim for it to be mine, but you know it's just a fun little product, something to work on. And, you know, and it's and, and it is actually kind of neat. You know, if, if you're keeping it in mind that it's not original, but you're changing something that someone else did, and you can see the difference. Um, that really, it's, it's something that's uh, you know that, that really can help you feel how you're making progress. Uh, again, this is just something I've played with a little bit, playing with something. This is a uh, jQuery library that someone has a guiding uh, uh, project called Mosaic. It gives you all these different ways to have these boxes. For a beginner like me, you know, getting something is up, up and running and then changing it, um, this was probably like six or eight months ago, was, you know, it was a little bit of a process. It was a little bit, uh, you know, at the time I was a little bit too impressed with myself to be able to do that. Uh, but again, it's just uh, things to do as an exercise. So as I'm going through things, um, the kind of uh, questions, uh, a lot of folks would say, you know, well, which way should I go? You know, I don't know what to do. Get kind of some uh, analysis paralysis. I would say, you know, just go and try things. Um, you know, I didn't even talk about it. You know, we don't have the time to talk about like, should Ruby or Python, you know, or Django or Rails. Try, you know, try both. Try neither. You know, there's tons more uh, free tutorials on those, and those are the things that if you're looking at a web startup and you don't have web application, those are the things that you really can look kind of uh, the areas you want to look at. What am I doing wrong? So I'm kind of making myself my own co-founder. Uh, I know that uh, you know, working teams is usually more, a lot more uh, efficient. So, um, you know, so uh, you know, that's, that's definitely something where uh, uh, you know, I want to, um, you know, down the road kind of take a look, you know, but right now I really kind of feel like I want to get to, uh, get to a, a place where I can kind of build stuff on my own. So any questions? I got um you kind of touched on this a little bit at the end. Do you see this as you actually do want to become the technical programmer or do you see this as you want to be able to speak the same language and you would actually find the technical programmer? I think um, <clears throat> kind of you know because I have a lot of this, just a lot of sales background. Maybe kind of my technical role would be like a junior technical um, co-founder. So you know if uh, you know if it was two people and start, you know, maybe we have uh, you know, a sales guy and uh, one and, you know it's two people and one sales guy and one and a quarter technical. Um, so I'll be able to you know still be able to kind of do things, still be able to kind of work on things. Uh, but not, you know, I don't necessarily need to be technically. But what you bring up is still being able to speak the language is pretty important too. Right? So let me follow up on that, maybe so you guys want to get a little bit 
So, and, and I think Kevin, if, if you share that list, I mean, it's an amazing list. And, and blog that has actual sources that he showed. And it's, a, it's great because you can see more or less kind of explore the different types of codes that are out there. And it's very yeah, I think we can get all the all the slide decks that we put up out here and every There's an email you sent me though that had left. Yeah, I, that I, I can get that. Um, and you're also going to I can get you the link that that bridge URL. Um, and also uh, I'll I'll tweet out a link to all the Google Docs that just all those things that I have. And one thing about those two is like it took me longer like, to figure out what not to talk, I mean, to talk about like, all these different resources that I've used. Um, you know, my girlfriend is not very technical. She looks at stuff, she's like, wow, we learned a lot. I'm like, I feel like I copied a lot from a lot of different people. Like some people, you know, I learned, I, you know, I guess I didn't learn it, but you know, other you know, I, I, I got for so many different sources. So, you know, there's just, if, if you want to learn anything, if you want to do anything, 12 different people have a site out there about how to do it, even for every single thing. And there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that I could I could have for a whole hour about different things to, um, you know, scroll through one site, you know, and it's the same about what you're doing. Great, you want to laugh about that stuff either. I mean, I, I know personally, as a designer, I'm sure well to speak this too. I mean, you learn initially and continue to learn by, you know, your source. Like, right. The books are great, but I mean, as long as you're not ripping off something wholesale, um, like that's how everyone in the business learns that stuff. And, and similarly, uh, just open source software. Yeah. Go on GitHub, read yeah. through the repositories because the code is all there. Uh, and, and to be clear, too, like I constantly take other sites, copy code over, and break it and try to build it. And I just wouldn't like ever try to pass it off as mine. Literally, in the past like, year and a half or so, and most people that have ever seen it just happen just right now. You know, so, you know, it's just, uh, you know, these are sandboxes for me, these are uh, playground something to do, something to work on, projects to work on. To learn, you know, like different things about how, um, how web pages are built you know, and how web applications kind of uh, will interact with. I think everybody, I mean, from what I've understood about, Learning the code, learning the program. It just—it's a certain mindset. It's like a, a programmer is a problem solver, and you know some people have that skill set and think like that really analytically, and some people don't. And I think you just got to take a look at where your skill sets are really where they lie, and just play to your strengths. You know, I don't think if you're if you're looking to found a business, you can't find a technical co-founder. It might not be the best use of your time to go and try and make code. You know what I mean? Um, but I think just naturally where you fit in, where your skills are, uh, find somebody for the work. I mean, you really got to play to your strengths. I mean, I, because I've actually been going through this with myself, um, I, I work for four or five marketing branding companies. I've phenomenal design, even though I'm a developer. Uh, but I can't create it. I, I, I can't lay out a page and design it. I, I can make it work. Um, and I realized I didn't have, well, I didn't want to weigh out the capital to hire a designer. No one else to make. Um, but uh, I set up trade. I found a designer that works out of co-working. I said, hey, you got a website. I'll trade you hosting for life. And I'll, get you, I'll cover your domain costs and everything. I, I used the assets that I had available to me. And he did my design uh, for the, the logo and the business cards. You know, it's like finding, you know, right away what you can and cannot do. And it, it took me a second to say, oh yeah, I really can't design, even though I, I do have this eye for it. Um, and, and finding the resources to get out there. So I think it's quite the same in the office. Yeah, I'm going to take a quick break here. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to say is it was very interesting to hear all of us talk um, and how we all had slightly different approaches to the same problem, which is actually getting the thing built. I think Karen did a good job of finding a you know, diverse approach to it from all of us. Because um, obviously, you know, the way, you know, especially Mark, uh, you know, approached finding a developer was very interesting to hear and, and how it was a slow process, because I've actually never seen that side of it. Um, 
so that it's very interesting. Yeah, I think this was awesome. Right? This is probably one of my favorite ones of the I've been all of them. Well, you said diverse, so let's come. You said the diverse approach is to solve this problem. You know, what, what, what's the common thing? It's the common thread, kind of thread. thread between the five solutions. Or you weren't listening to the other <laughs> Think like a desire to find mature ground in communication. Okay. Yeah, and then to, to get a startup going, to start something from nothing, you need to be you need to be passionate and you need to have perseverance. You're not going to give up the first time you hear uh, no. You know, the first time somebody says, "I'm not going to be your technical co-founder," if you give up, I mean, you're not a you're not a founder. You're not a starter. So I think everybody on this panel obviously has been told no, um, all the way out to you having to go hire it out. I mean, you, you still press forward, and uh, I think that's the kind of threat is that you know, everybody who is going to make it is going to press forward um, until they can make it. No matter the approach they end up taking, it might be the wrong approach, it might be the right one, but they're going to get to that end point. And I think one thing with Urban too is like I think especially with like learning something that's like a skill or a craft or something, I'll go through phases where like I'll be for like a month or two, like I just feel like I haven't made any progress or anything. I'm like I just I can't, you know, and I feel like I've learned something but I don't know how to prove it and you know, I don't know what I don't know and it's so easy to get discouraged. And um, you know, then I look back at something and you know other things I've worked on and, and been like okay yeah I was working on that and I couldn't solve this couldn't solve this like oh that's this this and this I'm like wow that was two months ago it was like my biggest problem and this morning I was just like feeling sorry for myself like I didn't actually learn anything I'm not getting any better and now I'm looking at a problem something that I thought was a problem two months ago I'm like oh phew, I can do that that's easy enough. so you know it, it's important to really kind of look at your progress and make sure that you're actually making it um, I, I do think like one thing I, I want to stress, and I kind of um, uh, got a little bit distracted. Um, while I was up there, my girlfriend actually just drove to Maine today. While I was up there, her mom actually called me. And she was supposed to text me when she got there. So when her mom called me, that, that kind of distracted me, threw me off uh, for a moment. Um, but point being is one thing that I wanted to, to really kind of um, uh, talk about is like with making myself my own co founder, is like I do understand that, you know, I. Being a team of one forever probably is not a good idea. Um, so having the opportunity to kind of collaborate with people and have uh, people push, you know, other people push you or other people have not had to think about your ideas. You know, with anything that I've done, you know, I've always had great um, success in working with other people. Even like something totally opposite of skiing. I've done some of my best skiing when I've been going skiing with someone who's better than me and I'm trying to keep up with So, you know, Although now, right now, you know, I am doing this kind of like by myself trying to make my own sales and take like my poker um, I, I do understand that it's other than the team can be important for too. Um, one common thread I heard all of us say was about networking. I think every single one of us mentioned in some capacity either people and blogs that we're following or groups that we're participating in. They mentioned you outside any of my group. Um, I don't, yes, I, I run the JavaScript group. You know, these guys all mention stuff. I, I think there's a common thread. It, it, it's very interesting, and uh, I know Nate's very active in the groups, and so is Taren and stuff, that we constantly are always seeing the same faces at the JavaScript group, the WordPress group, the Ruby group. You know, and I know Taren was interested in Ruby for a while, but I don't think I ever really pursued it too much. You know, I gave huh? I, I a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. Well, I <laughs> You know, really strikes at it is that we're all realizing that the networking is what's going to help us find the resources if we need it or want it at that point. So, um, something that's kind of not directly related, but um, just popping in my head. Uh, you mentioned, you know, no knockout. You and I were on a no knockout team last year. Um, award winning. Yes, the award winning design category. Um, no knockout. Is that it? <laughs> Sorry. They're not going to say 48 hour yeah. programming competition um, using uh, Node.js. Uh, there's similar competitions for other languages and frameworks. Uh, you had done Rails Rumbles before, and 
you know, similar to like Startup Weekend, stuff like that too. Those are kind of interesting. Oh, I think the programming competitions are making it even better because you need a real tangible thing. They're, they're very distinctly different. Um, but th those are exciting just because it compresses the develop, the, you know, the ideation and the development and the deployment cycle into a 48 hour period. Um, that in some ways is more rewarding than trying to you know, work on this plan for a business or for a startup because you, know, you don't know if it's going to be successful. Like, we crammed in, in this case, success into 48 hours. It could have been a horrible failure. I mean, what was the percentage of, well, we, we of projects about, that didn't even finish? Yeah, I think I've done three of them, but I've done three or four. And the first three were failures, and the last one was the most successful. And what was interesting is through the different iterations, I've learned very quickly how, how little you can actually get done for eight dollars. And it really gets you to hone your skills and figure out, okay, this is what we can do. And even with four of these under my belt, and you've done what, one or two? One. Okay. Um, but Dave, uh, who's on our yeah. team, he had done three as well. Uh, we still screwed up. We, we did, uh, we required authentication, and we realized that we blew eight hours of time doing that, yeah. and we didn't even actually need that. So we've even yet found even a better way. But they, tell your girlfriends and wives that you're going to be gone for a weekend, and like, go, Pay on 20, 50 bucks on pizza and get involved in the team because it is actually a really quick and rapid way to, to, to kind of realize, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you fail, but you're going to learn a lot in that 48 hours. And there's a lot of skills that I've picked up from them that you did a lot of The takeaways are fantastic. I mean, yeah, just, I mean, talk about honing in on the minimum file the product. To, to actually be able to build something that amount of time is pretty impressive. Um, obviously, the project management team building, all that type of stuff works um, really well. We actually had a couple of planning sessions before um, the 40 hour start, which was allowed in this case. Um, and that, that worked really well. Also, another takeaway from that too, um, when I talked about you know, being open to input on and changing your plan lines, you know, the app we built last year was kind of largely something that I kind of tossed out there. It's like, hey, let's build this thing. And then one of our other developers um, tossed out an idea that changed it pretty dramatically but changed it for the better, and it, it turned into something very different. Uh, and that was the smartest thing we ever could have done, because that made it easier to build. Uh, it, it limited our scope, uh, and it, it made it, in some ways, more fun for what we were trying to create. Now, um, Startup Weekend, because I can talk to both of these uh, Startup Weekend is a much different approach. Startup Weekend is, I approached it, unfortunately, from the wrong direction of, hey, we got to actually build something in 48 hours. And the reality is, is and looking at the teams that I know well is there, uh, uh, observing at the end, one of the teams, you were a judge or something, right? Was a, uh, yeah, yeah sure. that's right, okay. Um, it, it, was, it was more about coming up with a business plan, an idea that could be viably built later on than I think it was actually trying to cram something in 48 hours. Uh, so there is two distinct different approaches to each other. We both had their pros and cons. While we're on the subject of sort of hacker contest, there's something this Saturday at Syracuse that is, is less than 40 hours. It's only like something's been a day. And then yeah, I think it's this Saturday. Yeah, it's this Saturday. Saturday is like 10 hours or something. Um, the problem with a hacker or something. Hackathon. Hackathon, yeah. So, uh, but it, it is a contest. Uh, Twilio is sponsoring it, and you just have to use Twilio API. And, I think to at least one of those here. I mean, literally, yeah. I think that was so. Yeah. Where is it? Based on, it's based on Twitter or something? Yeah, I think you have to use yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah. for like, yeah. be a project you haven't worked on yet. Like, cash prizes. And this is where, sir? It's in Syria. It's not Syria. Thank you. The coordinates on this will be up on. Next already up on this. I don't think we're supposed to because it's kind of, it's not it's supposed to be their friends and their friends' friends or something. I don't know. Okay. It's up there. I think Twilio will find that's their that's their own methodology for the childhood ecosystem. Right. No, no, that's the high card of people. It's a class and average everybody. You might know more than that. I have a kind of question for the audience. Is there anyone here today just like a non Technical co founder and has thought about or kind of, or, or, or a non technical co founder wannabe, which is not a bad thing. Um, 
and just kind of thought about like using one of the different directions that we used. Using one of the Different directions that we used. Or is there anyone that's like a non-technical uh, must be a profile? I mean, I'm a non-technical profile, although I have a background, I work down with the I'm sorry. <laughs> Some idea. Uh, you know, I can talk to tech people. Uh, I have an understanding more or less the picture of uh, uh, code that much. It writes HTML and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I find it you know, useful. I'm good at translating ideas from the tech to the non tech and vice versa. Um, and we've uh, been our first for a while for a technical co founder. Although we have struggled with that, we have a product that exists, um, but it could be so much better at design and some other stuff. Here. So, what, what is the leverage, not the activities or the skills, what is the leverage you will get from the technical world? Um, the ability to implement certain parts of our site that we envision that we, we are not capable of our doing it on our own. We, we, we have, yeah, that's, that's technical. Well, yeah, except that we want buy-in of somebody who, who is going to be the part and help us get to where we want to be. Okay. So hopefully not be stupid. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm, I'm poking at it a little bit. Right. No, I, you know, there, there's, there's the co-founder or work for hire. I mean, there's nothing, right? And, and this is a big distinction. And uh, in, in some of the places that I've helped out, one of the things that I do is I help them decide whether they want to listen to their technical people or not. And I've, I've been fortunate in a sense that, that a couple of times they've been in deep trouble because they were not listening to their technical people and uh, were in you know, enough trouble that they wouldn't want to hire somebody to go, oh, oh fix it. And it's like, okay, you, you stop talking and get the wax out of your ears and, and you calm down and, and use small words. And, and tell them what they need to do, not how evil they are. Yeah, yeah. they just want to say, you know, you're exactly right. We're looking for someone who can say, okay, here's this, how about if you try this, and we'll be even better than that. You know, maybe that, that's what we're looking for, a partner. I, I think this comes back to some of the flags that Nate and I have mentioned. Uh, you've got to be able to listen to the people that you're bringing resources into. Yeah, 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 on to, on to if I'm bringing a designer on board, I should listen to his ideas or her ideas on color, you know, or typography. Or, you know, that's why that person is coming around. If you're not listening to a technical co-founder, well, why would you bring that person on board? Yeah, and they got to bring value too. I mean, you got to look at each area of the business. And if I'm the business side co-founder and I can't bring in investors and sell the investors and get them to close the deal, then I'm not adding value. And if you bring in any old technical co-founder who can't really tell you technical direction, they can just do, they can write the code you tell them to write, but they're not bringing value. So, and you gotta look not only just for a technical co-founder, but one that brings value to the business. And if you're gonna equity align somebody with your organization, you better make sure that they're gonna add a lot of value to your business because hopefully you're working hard at what you do and you want expect the same from the co-founding team. So it's a, it's a lot of vetting that goes on um, through that process. And you know, sometimes you, you don't even ask them at first. You just see what type of work they pump out. And if they do something well, well then, then you approach them. Thank you, Chairman. I experienced two So as some of you may know, I was working on a, a mobile app. Um, and we would two other guys, and we recently just decided to stop um, working on it. But, you know, I was a non-technical uh, person, and then, you know, I was working with two developers, and we also um, brought in a designer, too. And at the end of the day, we were all kind of moonlighting, and I think that that was my biggest learning experience, um, was that we all kind of had different uh, dedication levels, and I think if you're bringing somebody on as a co-founder, I mean, they truly have to be dedicated. Um, and even if you think they are, I mean, priorities change if you're kind of getting drawn out and um, things like that. So I, I guess that was kind of 
with that motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, well, we can wrap it up officially. Uh, thank you guys. This is awesome. Everybody's off Instagram and talk to Jim. <laughs> <laughs>